The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Our guest today is Dr. Helen Morrison. Thank you for taking the time today. Well, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, actually, one of our contributors uh, had you in one of his movies, John Borowski, and uh, that's how oh he, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah he's on. He does our um, kind of our con- contributions with the indie filmmakers, so he's uh, part of the team. It's a, it's a pleasure to have well, you that's here. Great. Yeah. So well, it's nice to be here. So now uh, in the book, of course, uh, the most popular and the one that um, um, gets my attention is John Wayne Gacy. Um, yeah. But you've also uh, interviewed quite a few others. Like maybe maybe let's talk about your history first before we get into details. Uh, how, how many serial killers do you think you've uh, actually uh, been around and, and profiled? Well, to date, there are about 125 of them from around the world. Uh, That's not just the United States. Um, And so I've had a tremendous amount of material that I can talk about. Yeah. Uh, Before we get in, how how does that affect you on day-to-day life? Like when you're going through these um, serial killing profiles and when you actually mm-hmm. like with Gacy and you're in the trial and you're mm-hmm. interviewing mm-hmm. and all that stuff what what happens to your personal life? I think I think what happens to my personal life is I have it very separate I can separate my personal life from my professional life and that came with a lot of uh, work in recognizing how you can get affected by this. And if you do get affected by it, it can definitely skew your perceptions of what's going on. I, so yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a struggle to maintain that kind of, of separation, but it's worth it. it now, uh, besides Gacy, who, who's been, well, I don't want to say the, the best, but who was the most... <laughs> who, well, who did you think, who of all these serial killers do you think you learned the most from? I think I learned the most from Robert Berdella, who was considered uh, the butcher of Kansas City. Um, and I learned it because he taught us, taught me, that scientific inquiry covers a lot of territory because he kept meticulous, meticulous notebooks of everything that he did to his victims. And he very much like um, we looked at his, 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 well, I guess you could say his writings as, as if they were a scientific experiment. Wow. Now, he was performing the experiment, or? Yes, he was. He would, well, let me give you an example. Uh, When he would capture uh, a victim, he would keep them chained up in the basement, and he would do various things like he would infect infect them with um, a bacteria or something like that. And then he would very carefully monitor all the vital signs. He would take their temperature. He would see how they were doing with uh, the response to the environment. And uh, he kept this going with all of his victims. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, wow. What can you say? Um, well, well what, what made him think he was qualified to do that? I mean, was he a doctor what? or was he a no, lab assistant? No. He was just a person who observed things. I mean, one of the things a serial killer does is they are good observers. They have a knack for picking out the person that will go with them, or the person who will cooperate with them, and they have almost a sixth sense of knowing what they, what they can do and what they can't do. 
Otherwise, how is it that they manage to see a group of people and pick the one person that they will think for themselves? Mm, true. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're going to get to that in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and, and so when we, when we talk about um, John Wayne Gacy, um, yes. how did you, first of all, how did you get involved in the trial? Well, I got involved in seeing him first, um, and that came from an article that was in the Chicago Tribune about my work, and one of his lawyers contacted me and asked me what I thought, and I told him, I I explained who I thought he was or what I thought he was, and they thought I had seen him because I described him so perfectly but I was going on the basis of my knowledge of their serial killers. And so I got the chance to meet with him in the Cook County Jail Hospital on many occasions. Um, And then I managed to, uh, they called me to testify in his trial, which uh, was in a circus, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, then I managed to continue my work with Gacy after he was in prison and up until the day he was executed. It was a, a circus. <laughs> Pardon the pun. It, <laughs> I've got to say that. <laughs> he, he was a clown. <laughs> you know? oh. but, <laughs> well, uh, but... Actually, lie in 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 the trial he was. I remember listening, and there you were talking about how he would uh, grin and roll his eyes and and even laugh at the people that had been uh, attacked by him, and yes. it was almost like uh, you know it, it was totally out of place. And of course, the jury probably didn't like that. No, they didn't, but, uh, you know, that's something a serial killer doesn't really care about what other people think. They don't care about other people in general uh, because they are so so interrupted in their development that they never develop any contact or empathy with the people that they are around, even their wives or their children. Yeah, but th- this had to show his his feeling of, of dominance, his his oh. feeling of, of, you know, I'm in charge, I'm in control, oh, good Lord, here we go with your feelings. Mm-hmm. That's, that's them. They, they are very what we would call narcissistic. Mm-hmm. It's all about them. It's about nothing else. When you when you were talking about that, um, you were mentioning how um, it's something that they almost can't control, and you were comparing it to our auto, like if our hands, uh, the palm of our hands sweat or our heart races, mm-hmm. it's not something we tell ourselves to do. It's just something automated. Mm-hmm. How, how, so how, it, maybe explain that for listeners, like what what you mean by that with him and his killing. That it's almost like he's following a script that has not been written. That it's the same thing over again. It's, it's first how they choose the victim. Second, how they get the victim to come with them. Third, what they do when they first uh, capture their victim. Uh, then what they do in the process of killing their victim. And what they do afterwards. It's, it's very stepwise. It's, it's almost as if they were following a script. Yeah. It's so automatic for them. Well, it, it, in, a, in an essence, uh, okay, I, I don't want to get too far ahead, but in a sense they are following a script, and this is a script that has been developed over the years of their sociopathic behaviors. Well, it, if they were sociopaths, we could do something about them. Um, but we are not in any way, shape, or form capable of working with them as if they were a totally together human being and if they were together with a personality and with a structure that we might be able to work with. You know, you 
if you have to, when you're thinking about dealing with a person, you have to know that they are intact psychologically. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they're, they're normal, okay? But they're intact psychologically, so you could develop some type of a working relationship with them. And then you can move on to other other interventions. But with the serial killer, it's like I spent 600 hours with John Gacy, and I think that John Gacy never in any way, shape, or form saw me as a person. How, how did you feel? I mean, how did you feel that he was seeing you? Well, you know, basically, um, that's another thing you can do. You can separate yourself and your person from your job. And my job was to know everything I could know about them and everything I could find out about them using whatever means I had available. Um, but most of it is talking. And, and, you know, if you start with a serial murderer, he can start at looking like a regular person. He can, you know, have mm -hmm. have the social graces, the 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 superficial caring. Um, but if you spend time with them, then they disintegrate into a very primitive person. Oh, and uh, that. Gosh. Uh, I, well, I, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Basically, all of their emotions, everything that you see on the surface is all rehearsed. It, it's like a mask. Yes. It, it's yes. almost as yes. if they're looking at you saying, well, I think this is how a human should respond. Yes, that's about you know, it. You, you tell them a sad story. Oh, that's terrible. But they're really not feeling it, but they know that's how they should respond. But yes. how, how did you feel that he was seeing you once you got past all that minutia? He saw me as a thing to use. That he could, he could use me, he thought, to get whatever he wanted. Now, going back to the, to the murders and, and the relationships that they developed, Yes. When we say that they were rehearsed and 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 they were like reenacting something, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. what I'm that, that's what I'm saying. There there was a trigger event that happened at some point in their lives that, that caused them to kill in a certain way. Not necessarily. There isn't any one thing that they ever had as a triggering device. They seem to have gotten stuck at the first phase of separation and individuation as an infant. At that every infant goes through that. You remember the, the baby who is at nine months of age or seven months of age who could be passed around to everybody in the world and wouldn't yes. have a, a reaction. Then all of a sudden he becomes frantic if he's separated from his primary caretaker. You know, have you ever seen a baby react like that? Um, yeah, Kevin, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of our, our hallmarks of separation individuation. That somehow, and I'm not adultomorphizing this, but we see that the child has a different reaction than he had before. So there, is there something that they recognize and that they have to cope with that they didn't have to cope with at an earlier stage of development? The serial murderer never, never, never becomes an individual person. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, let me let, let me make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. Would it be fair to say that it's not so much as a trigger event as it is a trigger feeling? Finally, somebody yes. has made them feel something that begins this process. Something does, but we don't know what it what it is. 
I mean, mm-hmm. of all the people that I've, that I've gone through and I've, I've spent lots and lots of time with, I still don't know, except I'm convinced that they don't make it through any separation into visualization phase. They don't make it. Wow. Well, you have just ruined every season of Criminal Minds for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. It's so interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. They, they, can, they come up with such interesting kinds of reasons. Uh, and that's what people thought, that um, they, Casey killed boys because he didn't get along with his father. or um, they, they all have a reason for it. Yeah. You know, but but not necessarily. You know, I, I I'm with you in the fact that I disagree with that because it, let's look at your but let's look at your normal uh, and I use that term loosely serial <laughs> serial killer your your average everyday serial killer. Yep. <laughs> but most of them think of themselves as I'm more intelligent than all of these beings that I'm killing. I'm or oh, they're yeah. hunting me. You know, I'm, I'm so clever. intelligent. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But, but that's also the stage that you have to realize. An infant is the only person that exists. The infant whose own mind is the only person who's there. He is the world. The world is him. And oh. it's when when the child, when the infant or whatever we want to call them, has some recognition that they are definitely going to become dependent on something to survive, but they, in the beginning, feel that they can, they're managing everything themselves. Wow. That, that is, I mean, yeah, that's eye-opening. Now, now with Gacy, another thing here. Um, you mentioned how he was, he kind of idolized a detective he met when he was working as a cook, as a young person. <laughs> Yeah. And how, how how did he use that in his killings? He just basically knew that he could be caught, but it, and it was a person who was in, in law enforcement who would probably catch him, but it really it didn't make much difference to him. It really didn't. We always try to explain him or these other murderers as if we somehow know that they got identified with someone else who was more powerful than they were, but that didn't happen. Well, now, did, did, he, he tried to pretend to be a cop with a lot of the kids that he picked up. Oh, yeah. So, oh yeah. Well, yeah. you know, so did, so did Bundy. They, they they all managed to project some sense of uh, they are better than anybody else. They can control anybody else, and they find a persona that they can use. But they basically are capable of of convincing people that they are in charge. Wow, did he? Um, well, did he think he was killing people? Did he remember that he killed people? No, he, he knew that he 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 knew that he had done he had something, but that's one of the reasons that I think they keep souvenirs to remind themselves that there was something that they did, but they don't ever internalize it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I, I can't buy the fact that he didn't remember that he was killing people. He didn't. He didn't. He just knew that this stuff was going on, and that was it. And he, you know, you do one, two, three, and it's over. I mean, that's and a, he doesn't care. a made, he doesn't um, care. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Uh, I apologize. That's a major life-changing act to take a life. Well, if you feel that you are taking a life, if you're just doing an act, it doesn't mean anything to you. Oh, so like killing someone to him would be like, um, I'm going to move the bed from this side of the room to the other. <laughs> or fly or fly. Yeah, it's just uh, uh, you're doing yeah, something that's supposed to be done and it's not really uh, anything to yeah, think about. right. It's not it important. has no meaning, no meaning whatsoever. So it would be like doing, like we do mundane things that we just do, you know, fill our car up with gas. Yeah, brushing our teeth. Yeah, and, yeah. We're not, and we're not, we right. don't think about it except for at the moment no. when you don't remember it the next day. You just move on. Yeah, you just do it, right. So, so is that how he felt about every single human being around him then? Every single person. Well, how, every then, single person. And then how does he develop, how does someone like him, because he's not the only one, but he's the one we know, uh, how, did mm -hmm. he, how did he get into a relationship with a wife and have kids? Like, how does that develop? Because if I was to meet someone and you're dating someone and they're just kind of, you know, like that, that's not exactly, mm -hmm. how do you get close to someone like that? You don't get close to them. You're playing a role. Oh, yeah. That's all you're doing. And but his his wife or ex-wife in this case, I guess she didn't know she was just playing a role. No, no. Okay. So he, he was. No. He was really good. Oh, he was so good. He was so good. And 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 I will say, it's not like he was. Um, a Brad Pitt sort of figure. He wasn't like this. Uh, oh God, no! He was a dumpy guy. <laughs> well, that's what you know. Hey. That's what, no, <laughs> it's I, true. I'm a dumpy guy. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but it's it's true. This this he was he was. But they but, have a charisma. They yeah. have a charisma. They have something that that gets this person who will be the next victim to fall in love with them. In love meaning you know attraction. Whatever. Well, I, but you know, yeah. you have to take a look at Gacy's wife. Um, she knew, on some level, that there was something wrong because she smelled the bodies in the crawl space. Mm. Yes. But all she said to John was, "What is that smell?" And he said, oh, I just have to get some lime. It's a bunch of mice and all that other stuff. And she fell, full, fell for it, I guess you could say. She believed him. Because they pick people like that. If I'm going to keep him close to me, you've got to meet a certain profile that you're going to buy yes. this act. Because yes. he's portraying something much bigger. You know, we, yes. we talk about this... You know, this dumpy guy, but they have this charisma. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> I'm looking in the mirror now. Yeah. But no. <laughs> but because they're, they're portraying something. I don't want to be this big, huge, muscular guy that, you know, snaps necks, or I don't want to be this little guy that stabs people. I want to be this average, dumpy guy that nobody suspects. But I no, also I need I, I need to put on this bigger play, and I need the wife that, you know, oh, I'd never believe he'd do this, and I'm going to live in a neighborhood where the neighbors are like, oh, he was the greatest person, you know. Yeah. Well, let's, let's look at another case. The case in Kansas City, another Kansas murder, um... He had on his computer the information that would have gotten him convicted or arrested at least. He told his friend, his girlfriend, don't touch that computer. Don't go near that. She didn't. Why? I don't know. Curiosity would have gotten me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Yeah. But they, what is it about them that they just follow blindly? I, they, I don't know. <laughs> We've recently covered a story that made us ask the same question. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it's constant. Uh, you have to wonder. Um, now, uh, with with Gacy, even after he was convicted, did he realize that he had done these murders? That that it, or, no. or did, it did or did he? Well, after being convicted and told that you've killed thirty three, and they find find the bodies in his house. Uh huh. He still doesn't come. So, he still doesn't. No, he just did it. He just did it. They don't mean anything to him. Nothing. Wow. Wow. What that perfect in-law? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just, I just, I just have to think that. Um, so now, after he died, the the story is that you evaluated his brain. Yes. Yes, okay. I did. Okay. Now, as much as I could. And what because did, it was a dead, it, 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 it's a dead brain. Well, I, mean, I would hope. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, I saw a movie one time. <laughs> <laughs> now, what what did you come uh, to learn from the dead brain? Was it was there something uh, different that came through? No, there was nothing. There, I sent it to various pathologists and various neuropathologists uh, to slice it and dice it and do whatever they did with it. They found absolutely nothing. There was no tumor. There was no uh, kind of no kind of stuff that, that would make you think that um, there was something there. There was nothing. Absolutely no, nothing. And that's why we kept, we, we're still struggling to get permission to study them when they are alive. Yeah. And we, but you know, we won't do anything. It's not experimental. It's stuff that we do all the time. We transplant electrodes into people's brains all the time. And we just want to record them. But somehow they make it seem that it's experimental. And nobody wants their prison to be an experimental place. It, not even to save lives? No. No. They won't do it. Absolutely will not. And it's not just the United States that won't do it. It's everywhere I have been, from Germany through Japan through Indonesia, they will not give into it. They won't. They won't do it. Well, is that, is that just like kind of a, a spiritual or religious sort of reasoning, or is it um, like what? Like, cause I, I think, mean, you know, because something you got someone like Gacy or something like you know, we know they've killed thirty three people, and, mm -hmm. and there's mm -hmm. really no, you know, he's he's never going to get out, or if we're going to kill him, yeah, or whatever. I know. Right. So, so right. why not? Why why can't that be part of kind of, in a way, the punishment for? being that, and not even punishment, because like you said, it's more about finding out. It's, it's more about finding out, but they don't want us to do it. Nobody, and I've gone through, I can't tell you how many countries I've been through, including Russia. Oh, you, wow. you think they jump in on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they pay yep. you to do it. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, they could affect elections everywhere. <laughs> well, now, it, let, let me uh, uh, amend what, what Al just asked you, though. I mean, we implant, you know, we do experimental implants in cerebral palsy, Alzheimer's, yes. multiple yes, sclerosis. You know, and that's in an effort to heal. And if we yeah. look at this, you know, tendency towards serial killing, sociopathy, whatever you want to call it, if we look at it as a type of illness, why? what's the difference? That's what I'd like to know. There was a case in uh, Ohio many years ago called Kimowitz versus uh, the people who they were trying to to do experiments, and they came up with the fact that a, a killer or somebody in prison doesn't have the free will to give permission. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, because, because I, I, I got to disagree. We can't let them vote. I mean, how could... <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I mean, they're... 
they're still people, but I mean, once they're in prison and they see that something is wrong, you know, mm-hmm. you, you've, you've had some that have done that, you know, well, I've mm-hmm. killed 12 people, something's yeah. wrong with me, okay, well then sign here. Yeah. You know, yeah. Take advantage they, of that. There's a point in, in uh, working together where they want to be studied, but I don't believe that they would ever do it. I really don't believe it. Well, in that because they changed so much. In that case, but um, so as it stands right now, we have serial killers, uh, you know, such as Gacy. They they end up mm-hmm. being put in jail, and in a lot of cases, we don't kill them, or it takes years. So, oh yeah. So when it, when we're in that situation, are we going to learn anything or get any better at uh, trying to? Oh, I don't want to say cure, but maybe resolve. Evaluate. Yeah. I mean, how are we ever exactly. going to progress on this particular subject? Well, I guess they figure that there aren't that many serial killers that the number of victims really don't count. Well, tell that to the 33 <laughs> in the basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and no kidding. I mean, that's, you know, that's ridiculous because, you know, we... Yeah. You know, we have tons of uh, killers going on all the time, and it's not ending. Yeah. Well, what is really the, the the underlying issue? I mean, is it the invasiveness of it? I mean, there's lots of invasive approaches. <laughs> I don't think it has anything to do with it. I think it has to do with they don't want somebody to do experimentation. Right. They see it as experimentation. And one thing that has happened to most people who are in prison is they don't want to be experimented upon. Well, you know, it wasn't too long ago, it was maybe 30 years ago, that they used to do, go and, into prisons and they keep people volunteer for what would be clinical trials. So they would, for example, um, they'd use a shampoo and to see if they could count the flakes of dander. Okay. Um, but then, and the prisoners would get for that, but that stopped. That kind of experimentation stopped. Hmm. Well, we, we don't want them having dandruff problems or... Yeah, we're not putting we're not putting lipstick on them or anything like that. You know, looking for cancer. I mean, yeah. we yeah. want to stop killing. <laughs> yeah. right. now, do you now from all the serial killers from you know H.H. Uh, um, H. Holmes to the current time? Uh huh. Um, do you see a progression in the way serial killers behave? Do you see a, a change? Oh. No, still the no. Same? H.H. H. Holmes did the same thing. He was uh, very much a, a, on the surface, an accomplished person, but he had his own things that he did with the and how he got his victims. Well, he built a hotel here, but during the uh, Columbian Exposition, but he was able to get these people into this hotel and then slide them down the chute into his place where he would kill them. So it's just, it's, and it's, and you think it's the same, the, 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 they're a sociopath, psychopath, it's the same sort of... M- same mom. thing. Yeah. You know, but, but we use sociopaths and psychopaths as... They, those are real people. I mean, those are people who are flawed, but they've gone through the developmental phases. These kid, these serial killers never go through that developmental phase. Never. So is there any way we could spot them so that we can keep an eye out? <laughs> oh, boy, do I wish. Yeah. I wish I could. I mean, I wish I could say that this child who doesn't react at all to being separated um is going to be a serial killer. No, because then we've got the autistic kids, we've got the other kids who don't react. We can't do it that way. We just can't. Hmm. Well, um, and now you were also the last person 
um, to interview Ed Gein, weren't you? Yes, yes. Ed Gein was was a fascinating person. Um, he was successful as a serial killer only because we didn't have highways. Um, and I say that facetiously, <laughs> but most of he didn't have the interstates, and most of your killers get around a lot. Um, so he killed people in his neighborhood, um, but nobody suspected him. You know, he he basically made lampshades out of his, his people. He wore vests of the, their bodies. Uh, he did. He made soup bowls out of their skulls. Um, but he was as much of a serial killer as the people we are talking about from today, all the way back to H. H. Holmes. What makes someone like that? But uh, why didn't Gacy make? Um coat racks or, or lamps lamp shades out of her, his his <coughs> bodies like his, if, cause if because all, if, I was going to say if they're all equal in the sense that they think it's just doing something it's brushing my teeth it's killing this mm-hmm. guy and doing this and I need a new lamp or shade um, why, <laughs> well you know if, if it's that callous why why do, don't more of them do that but they are not limited to just one area they have many more things that they can do. They can get involved in very various places, various areas, various things. Uh, it's much more of a of a flexible um, world for them than it was for Holmes. Or if well, it wasn't for Holmes. Dean, I think, would be, be the person I would say was most limited. And now I have to ask: When we get into something like uh, Jack the Ripper or something, do you, do you think oh, yes. do you think there's ever was it one person? And do you think that there's uh, like could you analyze something like that that's happened so long ago? Well, we could, but I wouldn't put any 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 stuff to it. I would. I mean, there's been a lot of stories about Jack the Ripper, and supposedly he's been discovered as as whatever he was. But um, I don't think that without real detail that you could make an assessment about the serial killer from that far back. Wow. What, what, so so we're just going to keep on getting serial killers and nothing's really going to change, is there? That's right. They're, they're probably, the FBI says there are at least seven of them out there at any one time. Oh, so we've got some action going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, so where do you, uh, I don't know, it's hard to say this, but... Um, so where do you see uh, policing um, with serial killers? Do you think we're any better at it? Um, no, <laughs> because we had a recent serial killer in Gary, Indiana, and, um, you know, everybody's accustomed or thinks about serial killers, but they didn't catch him until he did something stupid, which they always do. But... Um, the policing is, there is BICAP, which is the national registry for crimes. You can now co- co- coordinate some of your things with what's on BICAP, but that generally doesn't do anything with uh, catching the person who's doing, who's doing the serial killer. They are very clever. They're very clever. They know how to uh, keep their actions away from other people. They know how to hide. They know how to appear that everything is fine. You know, most people who kill people get really upset. I mean, that's, that's sort of a, a given. These guys don't. Yeah. And that goes back to my earlier point that they all think that they're so much smarter, I'm so much more intelligent yes. than you. But yeah. I've, I've, I, I know we're running short on time, but I've got to ask this. It, 
if I'm understanding you correctly, you're almost making it seem like serial killers are just these emotionless machines, and that these killings don't mean anything to them. It's just something that they automatically do. Yes. But but what about signatures? The signatures have captured a lot of these serial killers. They all perform this one action that, and I say this word intentionally, means something to them. Almost like they're reenacting something. And, and, and that speaks towards personality or speaks towards... No. No, it speaks to actions. Hmm. And actions don't have meaning. It's automatic. It's almost like an addiction. That they have to do it over and over and over again until they stop or are stopped. So does the average serial killer have an end? You know, like, okay, I'm done, this has completed? Um, no, they usually do something stupid, like Richard Masick, um, my first serial killer, um, had a taillight out in his car, and a policeman stopped him and said, you have a taillight out? And he said, yes, I do. And then he went home. And he moved his family to Wisconsin. Back, this is way, way back when. Um, they basically he he was disappeared until he sent back to Illinois for school records for his kids. Mm. That's how they found him. Oh. Okay, so when we go a little further here, how about, you know, how, okay. about, how about couple murders, like Fred and Rosemary West in England, and yes. we've had some, yes. you know. We've like, had some here, you know, yeah. Bernardo and. Deborah Brown. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, how, yeah. How, do, how does it, where you get two of them together, like, <laughs> do they recognize each other? Like, how do you know, how do you bring this up? You're dating some girl, and you go, oh, by the way, wouldn't it be fun <laughs> to kill these people? And how, Like, how does that. How do you recognize that in each they, other? They seem, they seem to have a sense of finding the person who would go along with them. Now, Deborah Brown was a, a very interesting person, but um, she seemed to have no recognition of herself beyond him. She was a part of him. She became part of him. So she had no separate identity herself. Oh, so she became like an arm or like a leg. Yes. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Just, just an extra little... Just an extra something, yeah. Yeah. Extra little appendage. <laughs> well, that's crazy. Um, so I just, <laughs> well, I just, I'm just trying to... Uh, it just seems... It weird. is. It, it just seems weird how... Uh, people just get together and start doing it as a couple. That's right. You know. That's and, right. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 so in that particular case, then, when you have a couple like these that are married, mm -hmm. um, what kind of a relationship do they have then? Do they, there's no love for each other or no caring? Like, how does, I try to define that. Like, how does that happen? Like, what, they're just together functioning? It's like work buddies? It's not just work buddies, but they are um, they're an appendage. It's, it's like an extra arm. It's just a bear. Wow. I, I just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying it, to think that. Yeah. I mean. It, it sounds like we're never going to figure I mean, any of this out. <laughs> no, we won't. We won't. I've given, I've given that, that uh, thing that I will collect the information, but I won't have any answers for you. Wow. So do you think that eventually if we um, open up the doors to evaluating the brains of people while they're still alive, we will discover more? Because do you think it's, like yes. a, it's a physical thing? It's not, you know, it's something that, yes. they're, yeah, they're going to figure out. Yeah. It's something in the limbic system. Uh, that manages our emotions and something that we will discover. 
but not for a long, long time. Do you think? Do you think it's part of evolution, in the sense that at one time, long time ago, us as humans and the human brain were just—it was normal to kill each other. Yeah, sure it was. It's the only way they survived. So, in, and over time, we've kind of uh, learned to grow out of it. Let's say. But yes. Some yes. people and just. There's still, yeah. There's still a primitive part of us. Did did you ever meet a serial killer that that scared you? Um, hmm. not that they scared me, perhaps, but when I would leave any serial killer, when I would leave the sessions with them, and those sessions lasted six to eight hours, so we're not talking about fifteen minutes. Um, I seemed to carry with me a tremendous fear that uh, I would go to my car and before I got in it, I would check every bit of the car to make sure that nobody was in it. Uh, I would check under the car. Uh, when I went into the hotel room, I would check behind the, the shower curtain. I would check in the closet. I would mm-hmm. check under the bed. Uh, that's what I carried with me, and that's what I had to cope with in getting myself together and reconstituted. So they made you more cautious, a little hypervigilant. I guess that would be it, but it's much more of a, a deep sense of fear. Did any of them ever threaten you? Or, or give you oh, the yeah. impression oh, that, yeah. that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, I have been threatened, but, you know, it's part of the business. Do you read um, killer books or watch movies? <laughs> oh, sure. I don't. <laughs> um, I don't watch movies because they're so unlike a serial killer. It makes me mad. Um, <laughs> but you know, like me with, like I do with prison yeah. movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's 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 stop with the fantasies. Um, but I do read, I read Patterson all the time. I read uh, all those guys that, you know, I just read them. Yeah. I find them fascinating. Well, that's amazing. Well, um, okay. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, now are you working on any new books or anything else coming out, or are you just sort of not... Mm-hmm. No, I'm not. I'm just seeing the people, and I haven't decided to write anything for a while um, because I'm just collecting information. Okay. Well. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Yeah, the the book is out, and uh, it's been out for quite a while. But uh, yes, I it has. Re- I recommend it, and I have it up on our website as well. Um, so, oh. <laughs> so everyone, pick it up. It's, it's, it's a fascinating read. It is. It's fascinating. It is. Yeah. It's, it is. It is incredible. Okay. So the book is my life, my, my life among the serial killers inside the minds of the world's most notorious murderers. Our guest has been Dr. Helen Morrison. Thank you for being here. And thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. 